How's it going, everyone? My name is Bert. And I'm Fonz. And this is Bert and Fonz. This is something that you and I have talked about many times outside of this podcast. But I wanted to bring it to this format specifically because I think this is something that, I don't know, other people may be interested in hearing. I mean, honestly, we don't really know for sure, but I personally think it's interesting enough that I want to talk about it here on this platform. Sure. And that is history as we were taught versus history as it might have been. And I'm going to stress might have been because some of it is factual. Some of it is, uh, it's hearsay. You know, honestly, it's anecdotal, anecdotal, but um, I, I just, I want to stress that. What I would like to stress, though, to that is that there's a lot of things that's not anecdotal that we actually know that they don't teach you in school. Well, that's also true. And we so like I said, some of that. it is fact, yes. and some of it is anecdotal because it it's based off of what possibly could be fact, but like between the two of us, we weren't able to necessarily source it specifically. Right. Well, but, and, but a lot of it is true and is not taught in school. I think I want to make that punctualization. Right. I'll give you an example that we don't need to dwell on, but here's a quick example. The, the Catholic, the Christian Church, I should say, yeah. they all agree that Saint Peter wrote Gospels, sure, or he wrote, you know, and Saint Peter's the first Pope, mind you, mm-hmm. but they're not accepted as the official Gospels. Mm-hmm. So no one, we can talk about that in a completely different episode. But that will be a different episode. This one, this one specifically, I wanted to start out with, is a character and i'm gonna i'm gonna say this specifically a character with that throughout history um that we both have uh not um, fondness would be a gross misinterpretation of the word Let, <laughs> let's say we've discussed him in the past a lot he, he right. gives us he gives us thread christopher columbus specifically christopher columbus who when i was growing up in school and was being taught this I don't remember what grade this was. I think it may have been third grade and up was when I was being taught this, but that he was the founder of America. <laughs> what do you mean the founder? Yeah, but like he found America. He laid the foundations of I get, okay, America. Okay, uh, finder. The finder. Oh, okay. The finder it. of the continent I'm sorry, of in, English is my second <laughs> language, so, you know, what do you want from me? I, I didn't know. Seriously. Oh, I mean, gra- grammatically, you are correct. Okay, good. But uh, that, that's just what I was taught. I, I didn't realize I had to question my language in school, too. <laughs> you know? Okay, so, he, yes, I understand that. But, so. but that, that's what I was taught, was that... He came over on the Nina, the Pinta, and the Santa Maria. The Nina. N- sorry, the Nina. Yeah. He, he came over on the Nina. On oh, the Nina, I mean. <laughs> so he came over on those three vessels, and from what I was taught, landed on, I believe, the east coast of what we know as the U.S. as it is today. Okay. That was what I was taught originally okay. in school. Wow. But as time has gone on, that sort of shifted and changed and different facts have come to light for example the fact that he never actually made it to north america proper where the u.s is it was like in the caribbean islands yeah where'd you get the east coast thing i didn't know that that's just what i was taught because like when we were being taught in school because you know i went to to english school for a while and i went to american school in germany so did they not teach you this part uh -uh, no they may not have said it specifically but the way that it was interpreted was that his interaction with Native Americans, and when they said Native Americans, they knew it as like Native Americans here in the United States, like in North America. Yeah, yeah. Um, and that was how it was taught because they would just say Native Americans. They didn't say natives or anything like that. Okay. It was Native yep. Americans. Yep. And the way that it was taught was that he landed somewhere along the coast because he had contact with those specific Native Americans that actually were not anywhere like the ones that he really encountered in the Caribbean islands. Okay. So how does that differ from what Ooh, you were sort yeah. of? Well, so there's there's several uh, things here. Um, yeah. So number one, um, there's a couple of points I want to make there. Um, so the myth that I was taught that coincides with yours is that he did discover America. Right. Uh, and I mean the American continent. Um, as you guys will learn, I don't usually refer to the United States of America as America. Well, because it's Americas. There's North and South America. I, I refer to both of them. Yeah, but in, in Spain we call... Venezuelans or Costa Ricans, we call them Americans too. 
Right, because they are South Americans. Right, right, right. Right. So anyway, but having said that, so the the first the, the first big fallacy of uh, Columbus is that he did discover America. And the one little thing, the one little drop that I'm going to throw out there right now is that it, had he done so, it, we would call it North Colombia and South Colombia, as the country of Colombia was in fact named after him, and the oh, continent. Okay. Yeah. So I didn't actually know that Colombia now is actually named that. It's after because, okay. Mr. Chris, Christopher Columbus. Which makes a lot of sense, and it, I obviously should have just known it, It's that. funny because yeah. it's not that obvious to a Spanish speaker, because although English speakers or Italians will refer to him as Columbus or Colombo, okay. uh, Spaniards refer to him as Colón. So a Spanish speaker has less of a leg to draw that inference that Colombia is af- in fact actually named after him. Interesting. So, yeah. So, um, Colón. Colón, Cristóbal Colón, that's how you say it in Spanish. Hmm. And I think in Italian it's Cristoforo Colombo, I think, something like that. Cristoforo Colombo. I, I don't know how to speak Italian, so that, <laughs> forgive me. It sounded nice. For I'll the impersonation, that. yeah, that was a little bit of a cartoon. Um, well, yeah, but I think it was also the fact of your like natural accent that you have that like right. pushed it over but the But I top. put the little melody, that's the, the cartoon part, is this is how in Spain we were limited in Italian, we'll do that little inflection melody that they use, you know. Cristoforo Colombo. You know, well, yeah. with my to Italian be fair, friends like speak. I've been that. to I've been to Italy several times, and there really is like that sort of like sing songy nature. Well, to it. a friend of mine who was from Rome, she spoke that way, right? And we'll get into that. But anyway, so the continents are named after another Italian called Americo Vespucci, or ever, I think in English it's Americo Vespucci. I'm not sure. Okay, so hence America because of Americo. So Americo is purported to have been, There's this goes back and forth depending on who's talking about this, but um, Americo is purported to have been the, pers- the first person to say, this is a separate body, this is a continent. Okay. This is not a part of Asia, which is what Columbus thought it was. Right. So the big thing is Columbus is, thinks he, he's going to Asia. That's why he calls the natives the Indians, because he believes he's rich reached the Indies. That's right, because he was trying to make a shortcut for trade to bypass the Silk Road, right? That is correct. He was trying to get to the Khans. Uh, He was an avid reader of Marco Polo's um, travels. Oh. The book of, what's it called? His book that he wrote, it's it's kind of a fancy title. I don't remember it now. The the Book of Marvels or something, I think is Marco Polo's accounts. Uh, But that was one. And then number two is um, that, uh, that, and this was a big fallacy that was that still goes rampant in Spain and is taught to kids in Spain is that uh, everybody in the time of Christopher Columbus thought the earth was flat. They were all a bunch of crazy flat earthers and here comes Columbus <laughs> the visionary and says, no, you fools, this is round, this is spheric, uh, you know, and that's actually not true either um, for several reasons. So in fact, we knew the earth was round centuries before this guy came came along, number one. Tell me more about that. Okay. The fact that in the time of Columbus, most people were illiterate and didn't receive normal schooling. Okay. And hard, most people didn't even know how to read or write. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. Also explains why most people were flat earthers. Because they just perceived whatever they could. Like, they look out, they don't see curvature. Right, they like see... this is, I'm standing on my boat two feet on this flat. How can this be? On a cobblestone street yeah. that, you know, just goes off straight. If and... this were a ball, I'd be falling off the other side. You know, <laughs> that kind of stuff. Yeah. So, right. So that was kind of the perception of the, um, the, the broader population. But then if you go to the higher wealthy classes, sure. there's astronomers, uh, there's a ton of scientists there, and they know there's a curvature. To the earth they already understand that and they understand gravity and they understand a bunch of stuff um they can actually calculate the circumference of the earth by doing uh, applying pythagorean mathematics to the distances of the stars oh so they were already doing star charts at that point oh yeah yeah okay. so there's a what's so there's there's i think it goes back and forth i don't know if it's a widespread um Knowledge, but for example, we, um, and I, when I say we, I mean Westerners. Right. Um, I'm not going to talk about Asian people or Chinese people because they go back way before our history does, so they right. know. And I don't think either of us are well-versed enough in right. that history. Right. Well, and I'm not well-versed enough, and in, in, I'm going to make my usual disclaimer here now. So <laughs> in my 20s, I read a lot of books. Um, it was very um, economic in um, Europe to actually have a library card. Sure. And I used public transportation daily. I didn't own a car. Um, so I always took two books out at 
weeks at a time. One was fiction, the other one was nonfiction. I would read them in the metro, in the bus. I would read them at night to sleep, you know, the fiction ones at night. So a lot of what I say comes from books that I've read. Um, some of them I've forgotten the authors. I've forgotten the books. Right. Uh, and anything that anybody wants to challenge me with, that's great. Um, give us some feedback, and we're always happy to learn new stuff and discuss it. So having said that, I'll dive right back in. Yeah, absolutely. Please do. So the person that we consider in Western civilization to be the father of history, in other words, the first person to write what we consider history um, annals, is that mm -hmm. what it's called? Like the, for annual um, journal. Yeah, kind of no, thing. I think that's... It's, Correct. I mean, there's different ways to right. say it, but... I used to mispronounce th there's it. There's annals, I'm very and then there's... Um, I've also heard it pronounced as annals. Right, right. But that, that always makes me giggle, so I pronounce it as annals. So I avoided it on purpose so that you could pick <laughs> it up. So the, the annals of history, I believe, is correct. Annals, yes. Which, as a Spanish, sounds funny in my head, though. So, cause, anyway, so the, um, the first father of history we can, is a guy called Herodotus. Okay. And it's this Greek dude that would travel, and this is like ancient Greece, he would travel around um, the known world back at the time, which is mainly Mediterranean and Middle East, and uh, would write down what he learned and the, his, the stories that he was told and he researched. So he's the first person to put writing to his history in writing, sorry, okay. of the Western civilization. So we're talking about Mediterranean. Okay, so very, very specifically calling out of the Western civilization. Right. I'm sure in China there was some dude that was like thousands of years earlier writing history. Sure. So but we're not going to go into that. So Herodotus goes, who goes really far back um, before Christ, writes about visiting the the ancient Egypt, the sorry, the Egyptian court. Uh, I don't know if it's Memphis or, or where. Like, And this is like, at the tail end of the Egypt, the 3,000 years of Egyptian... There's a place called Memphis in Egypt? Yeah, that's where Memphis comes from, sir. Not Memphis, Tennessee? No, Memphis, Tennessee is named after Memphis, Egypt. What? Yeah. Anyway, back to Herodotus. <laughs> T-I-L, today I learned. So Herodotus, this is taking too long, sorry, <laughs> but I, 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 I want to write this. No, on. you're fine. So Herodotus is the first guy. I read his nine books. It's called the Nine Books of History. Yeah, they're not as big as you would think when you think of nine books. They actually fit in one little book here. They're just like chapters. Yeah, I read his nine books of history, and then one point um, Herodotus talks to um, going to Egypt back at the very end of the three thousand years of Egyptian civilization. So in, they're in decay the then. They're they're no no longer the greatness that they used to have. Sure. But they're still considered huge by everybody else because they've been there longer than everyone else. And well, and they still have those monuments that are sticking up out of the sand. Right. So. But, but but that to them was already that that was that, that was his ancient history for them yeah. at that point. So to them, those pyramids were like Jesus Christ to us. That's how far back it was. Oh wow. Okay. Right. 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 So he's talking about the um, how he goes to inns. In, or taverns, I think, and, and he yeah. bef he befriends the astronomers of the pharaoh's court. And he says, these guys are so wicked smart. They know so much stuff. But when they get drunk, when they start drinking wine, they start talking about all kinds of crazy shit, like the earth is round. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that's how far back we already know that people knew that we weren't sitting on a flat plane. Right. So this whole story about Columbus coming in there saying, oh, fools, this is around. That's not what really happened. What I read about was Columbus was a, he was not an astronomer. He was not a geographer. So he didn't know much about that, but he was a great navigator. Okay. So he could navigate himself out of a storm. So a, as like a just general like sailor, he was right. really damn good. So he knows a lot of things about navigation that involve knowing your terrain and sure, knowing yeah. how to... Um, how to calculate distances and how to interpret stars and so, so he knows how to navigate really well. He is not an expert in geography, and he has interviewed or has talked to. Or, and I don't know how speculative this is, but the, a couple of sources that I read explained this. He's talked to shipwrecks that indicate they have found land right around the area where he wants to go. Okay. So here's what he immediately goes, okay, so the earth is round. Yeah, the stories have to come from somewhere. And he can calculate the distance based on all the accounts because he's such a good navigator. He says, I'm going to find, and then he makes the assumption that this is Asia. Okay. I'm going to find Asia right around here. So then he starts looking for sponsors, and he goes and hits the Portuguese because the Portuguese are well-known sailors who are at the most extreme point 
of Europe facing the right. Atlantic. So they're the ones that are further down. And he wants a sponsorship. So he goes to the court of the uh, Portuguese king, I believe it was, and the okay. as, the astronomers look at him and, and just laugh him out of court. Wow, really? like just straight up laugh him out of court? So pretty much. So what I am what I hear in Spain is like, you know, the Portuguese thought he was crazy because he was talking about the round earth and they were all flat earthers. So he came to Spain and the Catholic kings, uh, Queen Isabella and Queen King Ferdinand, Okay. Uh, they're called the Catholic Kings in Spain. Okay, okay, okay. Uh, is it, I did not actually know that. I know I've heard the names, but okay. not referred to as the Catholic Kings. Right. And, and by the way, it's it, Isabel, not Isabella. We'll get into that another time, because that's an interesting one. Fernando and Isabella. a lot of promises, my friend. And, <laughs> yes. So he goes to the Catholic Kings. This is this is the myth I'm told in school, right? So he goes to the Catholic Kings, and they have vision. So they give him what he needs, and he discovers a new world. And thanks to Spain, and here we go with the nationalism that they teach you in school instead of history. Right. Which I'm sure you in the United States have experienced quite a bit of as well. Uh, yeah. Yeah, that's fair to say. So instead of history, we got all this, hooray for us, nationalism crap. And Columbus makes it to the new world, and everything is fantastic. Now, here's what then I read happened, which I, and it was very well evident, and I much <laughs> prefer, uh, that's more convincing to me. So he goes to the Portuguese, and the Portuguese say, get out of here. Mm -hmm. And then when when the king asks, I don't know how that went down, but he asked the astronomers, says, this guy doesn't know. He thinks that the earth, he thinks this is the distance to circumnavigate the earth, which would make it an egg. Oh, okay. Nobody knows there's a continent there. They just think there's sea and more sea and more sea and more sea. So, so they think that if he does go out there, it's just a death sentence. Because they don't have, exactly. Because no, I, they don't have the technology to go that further right. than that. Like, there's no way that he can make it far enough to actually get to Asia because he's going to go through right. all of the sea. He's going to run out of provisions. They're going to starve right. to death. And the Portuguese are just seeing this idiot like in the middle of nowhere going like, where's Asia? Just floating there in, a, you know, in the middle of nowhere. So they say, we're not going to waste our time with this guy because, you know, he's, uh, he's a tinfoil, you know, just an idiot. Right. So they send him on his way. He goes to Spain. And the more pragmatic Fernando, I believe it is, goes to tell Isabel. Because the, the myth says that Isabel fell for Christopher's charms and all this crap, you know. Uh, but I think it went more down along the lines from what I've read that um, Fernando said. Hey, let's give him three little nutshells that we have there because the Pinta, the Niña de Santa Maria are caravelas, they're called. They're not, you know, they're kind of small, nimble ships. Compared to the other big yeah, galleons and everything. Right, right, yeah, right. Yeah. which would not make it that far either. And they, well, how, how much is it going to cost? We're going to give him these three ships. We're going to man it with um, prisoners because they just let all these people. Oh, that, prisoners. Yeah, they got all these criminals that says, hey, we're going to, do you want to hang from a tree or do you want to go with this crazy Italian, uh, you know, to the end of the sea? <laughs> well, I mean, I guess given those options, yeah, I would choose to go too. Right. It's like, it's instant death or maybe death. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so that's kind of that, how they phrase that. So all these, um, all these mothers just jump on this, these nutshells and just go on their merry way. And they bump into this new place in the Caribbean. I think they hit Santo Domingo first. Okay. Which is the Dominican I, Republic now. Yeah. I don't know. They call the I'm island, not versed enough in that to know specifically. So they call the island La Española, the, Span, the, the Spanish island. Okay. The island is uh, female gender in Spanish. Mm -hmm. Gender, not sex. Not the same thing. It's just a language thing. Right. It's a language thing. Uh, yeah. So we are persons. Pers the person gender is female. So when we talk about ourselves as person, we will use a female form. If we talk right. about ourselves as men, we'll use a male form. It's... We can talk about that another time also. So anyway, so they get there, and uh, and that's really what, what did happen. Okay, interesting. So so much different than what, I mean, there are, there is nuggets of truth throughout what we were both taught, but not a complete story because there's a lot of, how can I put this, uh, like fabrications and fable around it to make it seem like, like there's there's a different story that they wanted to tell to better shape how we would understand it to make it more digestible. No, there's just the usual telephone game with some political propaganda. All right, so so okay, so but but there's still like a fable aspect to it where it's like yeah. it's been said for so long that now it's just like oh of course that was what happened right, right. and there's a lot of, nope let's believe that because it conforms more with our personal um, narrative. That makes sense, and which is why you should always question everything you are told. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Within, yes, <laughs> very much so. <laughs> sure. So you're telling me 
that what you were told mm-hmm. was that Columbus did discover the new world. No, not, not did. He Talking didn't about discover discovery, let, don't get me started on Leif Erikson and Eric the Red. Oh, those are good ones. Because we know now for a fact that those guys established a colony. In right, America. right, right. So no discovery there. Right. But let's continue. And then there's people that split hairs. What well, it wasn't a discovery because they didn't announce it and they didn't make a formal, you know, taking. Anyway. Right. Not the first, not the first <laughs> European to hit American shores. Let's put it that way. Right. And so going off of that, like, discovering the fact that he actually landed in the Caribbean islands and like that whole area first Mm -hmm. and something that has been that I learned later in life, like hearing more and more about Christopher Columbus and then it's like, Oh, it's Columbus day and all this kind of stuff. Mm. And the fact that we had a Columbus day, and I'm going to say had because we no longer have Columbus day. It is now called indigenous people's day. Specifically because of all of the atrocities that Columbus and his men did to the actual natives of that time. No. Let me let me qualify that. All of the atrocities that Western Europeans perpetrated on the natives of this entire continent that Columbus's okay. expedition jump started. Okay, well that's so, that's, that's fair. Yeah, exactly. So that is fair. Because, um, but like, well, I was just thinking of it in terms of like just Columbus Day. Right, right. Like no, we I, don't call it that because there was some messed up stuff that happened. I, I get it, and and I get a lot of flack from um from Spaniards, um both friends and foes, sure, for supporting Indigenous Day and and supporting well, that I fully vindication. Support indigenous people's but, Day. But 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 I also I also have to, in fairness to them, also I also have to explain. That uh, because we had in Europe the whole Protestant versus Catholic um, schism going on. There's been a ton of atrocities perpetrated against each other. The Dutch and the English have very happily talked about the devastation of the Spaniards in the New World, right? And completely um, brushed under the carpet their own, which is pretty big. Uh, and uh, and not to point fingers because I don't want to deny that the Spaniards did make a lot of mistakes. There's a lot of reparation to offer. Sure, but which every is something single, I would love to know more about later on. But yes, every single force in Europe that had anything to do with colonizing the New World is responsible. Mm-hmm. Equally. Oh, I I totally like, agree. Uh, well, and I'll just point out one measure, and that not that I want to shift blames or anything, mm-hmm. but if you go down to South America, you'll still see Native American. F- features in everybody down there right in north america you don't not nearly as much you can count with your you know I mean, there's been a lot of decimation happen agreed in 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 the south there's been a lot of mix some of it forced so i'm not going to deny that either right so anyway everybody in europe has something to do with that and i am in full support of indigenous day as you are for those reasons i just wanted to point that out so yeah, one things that are actually in writing. So the thing is because um, number one, Christopher Columbus established a colony in La Española, right. and he was a governor. And Christopher Columbus is not a governor; he's a commander of a ship. So he had to be. So let me just get this right. He he was governor simply because he was like captain of the expedition. I believe right? he was governor for a while. I, maybe he 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 wasn't that all the time, but he he had a, he had a he say was the authority at in that the point. leadership. Yes, right. and this is a guy that is used to running ships in the 1400s. So he's he's used to establishing discipline by flogging people and, and, and planking people. That's how he operates. So now he's he's um, governing a bunch of very mild mannered um, criminals, indigenous people. No, I'm, oh, I'm okay. saying. Well, yeah. So you know, because they're they're enslaving these people, and he's sending right. slaves back to Spain to cover the cost of not having found the con yet and all that stuff. Oh, I and, suppose that's uh, right. Like he had to pay up on that expedition to make it worthwhile. Mm-hmm. So and there's a bunch he's of mercenaries. Not what he promised. Right, so he's sending all these slaves back to just to cover costs, and the kings are are writing back saying, "Hey, we're the Catholic king, so yeah, we can make money off of these dudes, but it doesn't look good on us to just do slave trade. Um, let's get get to where the silk is, all that stuff. So that stuff is going let's on. Legitimize these trades. <laughs> yeah, there's a ton of chaos going on in the colonies at first, and because he brings a bunch of criminals with and some right. mercenaries on the different expeditions. I mean, there's. I think there was one mercenary, Juan de something. I don't remember his name, who actually talks about how he rapes these Indian slaves that he has as servants, and he just writes about it happily because you know there's nothing wrong. To have these these are not people to him. 
Mm-hmm. So eventually one of the missionaries there, Bartholomew, Bartolomeo de las Casas is his name, started that's denouncing a, a <laughs> Bartholomew's of the houses, a literal translation. Well, I know that. That's but... his name, Bartolomeo de las Casas. But yeah, you don't have to pronounce that. But Bartholomew, um, he starts denouncing that and he actually renounces. He's given a position of authority in a couple of colonies and he just wants nothing to do with it. Mm-hmm. And he starts actually reporting back on the atrocities were perpetrating. In the meantime, uh, and you might might have heard of this, this is popular, um, popularly known, um, the Spaniards bring a bunch of diseases from Europe. Yes, that, I, did, I did hear about that. Right, and the native people are, their bodies are not prepared. They don't have natural defenses. No, not at them. all. So this just wipes them. I, wiped, I don't know what the numbers are, but they're staggering. Uh, the oh, I can believe people, that. Yeah. I can believe that. So those all the, that's, the, well, that's what's called in Spain the black legend of the discovery. So Ooh. all of this... So there's a lot of bad stuff going the on. Black legend. They call it the black legend. Well, so dark is associated in Spain to not good, you know, right? Like light and dark. But it's and, scary. But yeah, so the, the <laughs> usual like night and day, good and evil, horseshit. right? Uh, and so it's called uh, the dark. Uh, it would translate better to English as the dark legend, and it's, it's sure. literally verbally in Spanish, a black legend. Uh, and uh, and what's told about that is that it was made. It was exaggerated more by the English and the Germans and the Dutch because they wanted to make the Spaniards the villains that makes sense. of the colonization. Yeah, so that makes sense. there was horrible stuff that happened. Um, and again, I don't want to detract anything. And like I said, a lot of it is in writing and it's just, it's just appalling to read. And of course, you don't get any of that in school. Right. You'll get an intelligent history teacher because it's not forbidden either. It's just discouraged. Mm-hmm. But you'll get an intelligent teacher, you know, if you're interested in history, when you start growing up and you start asking questions, they'll, they'll tell you. Right. And they'll tell you, go to the library, read this guy, read that, you know. Right. They'll encourage you to go seek it out for yourself. Right. But the zeitgeist, the the main knowledge is, Columbus came and told these fools that the earth was round, and only the Spanish people had the valor <laughs> to support him. And la, la, la. There's all this horse shit, you know. It just falls on its face once right. you question it a little bit, so. So, Interesting. Yeah. So is Columbus still seen as like a, like a hero over there by the conservative um, uh, thinkers? Yes. Okay. And they're very, very so not with everyone, but he's still more revered there than he is here now. There's a main square in Madrid called the Statue, and there's a the big column with Christopher Columbus standing atop it, pointing at the Americas. Is it actually pointing out towards? Yes. And, th- and that is, there's several of those places. And um, there's one in Granada. There's a fountain, a, a famous um, statue of Christopher kneeling in front of Queen Isabella, showing the scroll of the map of the plan and Queen right, Isabella right. majestically looking down on him. So one thing that we talked about earlier that I wanted to kind of circle back to is that the reason Christopher Columbus was trying to do this journey in the first place was to establish a, uh, a shortcut, essentially, to get around the Silk Road. Now, with the Silk Road, you mentioned that he actually read the stories of Marco Polo. Mm-hmm. And Marco Polo is actually something that, or like, a, a, Marco Polo is actually a figure that I have become more interested in as I've become older. Because I kind of knew the story of like Marco Polo, and then everyone as a kid has played that game, like Marco Polo. Oh, right. You know, yeah. that kind of game. Um, so I, I knew the name, but I never really knew much of the history of it. Yeah. Or, like, who it was. And then, when I started to find out a little bit more, then comes this Netflix series show called Marco Polo. And the show is actually phenomenal. If if any of you out there are interested in just finding a really good show and have not seen the Marco Polo series, I highly recommend it. It's very entertaining. But, in this particular one, I, I just, there's no... Getting to know a little more about Marco Polo was interesting, and I, I I know that there's some inconsistencies with what is shown on the show, again versus what actually happened or might have actually happened in some cases. That usually happens with um with history based shows, right? right because it, it needs to be fictionalized a little bit in order to make it a more compelling story. Sometimes, right? Let me say something though, really quick to that. Um, not so much actually. So history is so fascinating. So that's why people that think that you should turn everything into Game of Thrones. And uh, <laughs> no, and Game of Thrones um, is very interesting. Well, because there's a lot of it's based off of a lot of actual history. That's my point. So, so what I'm trying to say is, actual history is fascinating. It can be very fun. And actually, Marco Polo's story is fascinating in and of itself. So, just in general. So, I believe that that series. I haven't seen it. Yeah, I think I saw the beginning of it on a plane or something, but I just dropped sure. it. Uh, but you should believe, watch it sometime. I will. Um, 
it doesn't need to derail all that much because Marco Polo's story in and of itself is fascinating. And in fact, there is a current of thought that says it's fiction. A lot of it is fiction. Um, Mar Marco Polo is not the show. Right, right. The, like his, his actual tale yeah, is yeah. fiction. That he stayed a little closer. He, he made it to the Middle East, but didn't get all the way to China. And actually and met with he, the Khan and everything? No, or? he never met with the Khan. He made it up so that he, when he came back, he could sell his words. There's a I'm, of thought, I'm going to choose not to believe that. Look it up. I, I'm, <laughs> I am not saying that's true. I'm saying it's it's been contested. Right. There's even that, that, that. That is one school of thought. There's even that. Okay. But um, but yeah, let's go. Go ahead and tell me about that. Well, let's just okay, so the whole thing around the show is that, like, the reason that Marco Polo even like the the show is about him, um, and being in what is known as part of Mongolia, which is actually Asia in this particular one, mm -hmm. um, but being with Kublai Khan, yeah, um, and having to try and establish trade between Italy and the Khan. Explain to people what the Khan is, because I think it's... So, so the Khan, or... So, when I say the Khan in Mongolian culture, and I didn't know much about Mongolian culture until I actually saw this show, which prompted me to actually start looking into it a lot myself. But I'm sure a lot of people, when they hear Khan, they think of, like, Genghis Khan. You mm -hmm. know, because he was a Khan. He was a leader of the Mongol people, and Khan is just, like, the term for the leader of the Mongol people of the time. So there's many, many different cons. There's great cons. There's all kinds of different cons. Mm -hmm. And then there's this one in particular. So this focuses around, I think it's Genghis's He's Genghis's grandson. grandson. Yeah. He's one of Genghis's grandsons. Yeah. So Kublai Khan, Genghis's grandson. And Marco Polo and his father and I think his uncle all go there. Yes. And they're supposed to be going to deliver priests. The let me stop you for a second. The point that I was trying to have you make really quick for everybody is that the Khan at the time of Marco Polo is pretty much de facto the emperor of China. So when Marco Polo goes to the Khan, he's in China. So the, the Mongols control all of China. The Mongol Empire, which was is so China. vast at that point, is right. that, yes, it was Mongolia and con like took over a large portion of Asia, which included China. But the whole thing about the show is that they're supposed to be bringing... Um, Christian priests or Catholic priests, I guess either is, they're interchangeable for this particular time period for the most part. Um, yeah, but yeah. But they're supposed to be bringing priest to the Khan mm -hmm. in order to like have him understand that religion better and just talk to these men of the faith okay. and get to know what they know. They didn't show up with that. They came with oil. Okay. And so he's like, okay, you failed me. You can leave and never return. You're banished from the empire. And they went, whoa, 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 not so fast. And so Marco's father looks to Marco and says, hey, how about I leave my son here with you? He's the most precious thing to me. And he can stay with you, and he's interesting and knowledgeable, and I'll come back with the priest as soon as I can. And oh, so wow. Marco is essentially treated as like a hostage, I guess. Yep, yep. Like, That's in fact he was he volunteered was. to be a hostage right. uh, on behalf of his father. And... The whole show takes place of like him talking with the Khan uh -huh. and like getting to learn like the Mongo culture through that interaction and then like actually starting to share stuff back and forth as he went. Okay. So I um so I, I know a little bit about that. Um I don't recall the hostage situation, but I can't swear that that's because Oh, it's bad recollection, so I have to go back sure. and look that up. I know for a fact that the story is Marco stayed with the Khan. Right. And he, he lived a few years there because it takes him all that much to go back to the Silk Route, all the way back to Italy with the traveling te technology that existed at the time. Right. Um, go in Italy, peddle their wares, refinance their next trip, whatever, come back through the route of Silk. And it, that, that Which was, was dangerous on its own. The, in and of itself, yeah, those those are months and months of caravan travel. Exactly. And in caravan travel, you even have like you know mercenaries protecting caravan from bandits. You go oh, yeah. through deserts. You go to you stop in cities and stay there for you know, uh, it's it's a long. We should actually research the Silk Road and um, and uh, and do do a podcast of that because that's. Really oh, I would love to do a podcast where we compare the Silk Road to the Old West. Oh hell yeah, we should, we should do that. <laughs> that would be a really cool. I'm one, down I think. for that. I'm totally down for that. <laughs> that should be awesome. So anyway, so I did know about this. Um, the story with um, the Khan 
is so he wrote this book called the Book of Marvels. Okay, I believe, and he died in prison. I think if Mary Marco Polo did, Marco Polo died okay. in prison. People um, not believing any of, they just said he made it all up because it was so fantastic. So he was the H.G. Wells of his so, time. So and, and yeah, <laughs> and not the first, not the last one for sure. Yeah, uh, and uh, and so then there's also this other current of scholars that go like, no, he actually went this far. And stayed in Uzbekistan or something. I don't sure. know. I don't know. I'm, I'm probably saying something completely like wrong. Well, I'm sure someone will fact check he, us. He, please. And, <laughs> but he stayed, I don't know if it was Turkey or something, or he stayed like in, midway. He just stayed there with sure. the king of whatever. And then he made up. And then other people, he does tell a lot of things that are really factual um, from the um, the Mongolian culture in China. So, for example, they had a, they had a really good um, courier service that was really advanced for the time okay and they had like this kind of a safe conduct it was like a passport a bronze thing that hung from their necks and oh they yeah they do the... they talk about that in the show too like it's your it, it's your free pass essentially to get anywhere like don't don't mess yeah. with this person yeah yeah, yeah. like and, he is an official messenger and it even grants con. you like horses like they had like a pony express type of thing really where you would stop at stations and they give you fresher horses and stuff like that so okay. you get faster and so there's a bunch of privileges you get from that so the thing that i love about that is um genghis and the mongolian culture right you know um but, uh, but but what else did you learn from that show that was interesting to you? There was a couple different things. Um, one of them specifically is the fact that, like the Mongol, like the culture as they were, just being specifically like these nomads that would always kind of like pick up and go anywhere, like historically being nomads. Mm -hmm. uh, and then to see them try and like, come into this more civilized world as the empire grew and they That's took over different point. cities and everything. Um, and then they actually, it's a big point of contention in the show. Like there are the Mongols who want to respect the tradition of their nomadic ways mm -hmm. and be that mm -hmm. and be the little more ruthless warrior type thing. Whereas mm -hmm. now in the empire, now that we're seeing, we can talk more about this in a little bit, Genghis's vision essentially of what he wanted to be was just like okay now that we've done the fighting now we can just start focusing right. on education and growing things and, and I now think that's his factual. grandsons are like this is what we want to do right 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 but there are people that are like there's a big point of contention in the series about that like these two different worlds clashing essentially yeah and, and I think that's a the usual growing pains that every culture that expands experiences. So that's well, especially when it's through such a forceful way to start with. Like there's always gonna be until that is kind of like died off, that's right. just like the mentality that people have adopted to get here and it's hard to kind of give that up on the spot. With some people and with some people not. So the same thing right. the same thing holds true with like the Germanic tribes during the Roman Empire when they were Romanized or the Gallic um people. It's the same thing. Sure. Uh, so Genghis is a really interesting he's one of the most fascinating characters in history to me and to many people too. So Genghis you're you're right. You know, Genghis starts um the the the, um, the Mongols are these um hoarders, these uh, cattle right. cattle herders, I'm sorry. They they move in hordes. That's, <laughs> that's different. Um uh, and uh and Genghis is as a child he avoids several different um assassination attempts cuz he's the heir of a chieftain. So there's they're always So it was it's always been kind of like at that point like a very tough so they're Culture. yes, they're very tough. They're um, they're no, nomadic people that move around Mongolia, which has like no access to the sea. Right. It's a big fat desert, you know, and they right. just move around with the cattle. They're horse riders. Uh, they they ride these small little, really sturdy, tough horses, mm -hmm. and they infight a lot. And so what Genghis does is he um, he starts uniting for the first time the divided Mongol, the different divided Mongol tribes. Okay. And uh, he does it in a very interesting way. What he does is he, um, he because they're a very aristocratic, kind of like authoritarian um, warrior caste that, um, right. that, that um, subdues the non-warriors kind of things. What he right. does is he takes the rich chieftains from other tribes and deposes them from their richness. And then elevates all the people that were oppressed under them. So now they all, <laughs> now they all love him. So right. That's how like they're they like, all, oh, now I have better status and standing. And yeah, they all rally behind him like, hey, Genghis, you know. And so right. And and at some point he actually, you know, and he just offers the um, the the people of the tribes he's about to attack. He offers them 
freeing them from, right. from the, their masters. So they revolt against their masters, and boom, here comes Angus. <laughs> so he's really, really good at that. He's a great strategist. And then he starts expanding his empire outwards. And the Mongols are actually known for having the biggest, one of the biggest extensions of land empires in the history of human civilization. Including bigger or not as big as the Roman Empire? Bigger than the Roman Empire. Bigger than the Much Roman Empire. Empire. Okay. Well, remember, it, 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 it takes China in. I guess that's true. You Asia is a very yeah. massive continent. Good luck so. finding the Roman Empire inside China if you lose it in there. <laughs> 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 so it's pretty big expanse of land, and this guy in record time just expands. And what he uses is fear. He's he's really good. So the reason I can believe it. I mean, he's depicted as a really ruthless, savage guy. He's he's smarter um, than ruthless, but he he, well, he wants his enemies to think he's a monster, which well, is why he did why... a really good job of that. I mean, like even that's what we were taught here was that he was just this savage killer. I mean, you could even look at um, Disney movies, like Disney's Mulan. Right. They have Genghis Khan in that, and he is just like this almost vampiric-looking, brutish, ogre, muscly, yeah. like, savage and, and that's, killer. And that's where I was headed. Right. So that's where I was at. He, he did purposefully um, spread fear among his enemies, so that at the end, actually, it was very economic to conquer new lands, because he just showed up there, and he said, pretty much the message was, if you surrender, you will live. And if you don't, we will massacre all of you. Ooh. So in the end, you know, doors just open as they write in. Hi, guys, you know, cause, <laughs> so they do a lot of, they save themselves a lot of fighting. So what they, you're saying is that Genghis did a lot of rumor mongering. Yes. In fact, he, he did a lot of psychological <laughs> warfare. Oh, so yeah, that's a, a great way to put so, it. So, yeah, so stuff that he, he did have. So they had these um, arrows. I don't know if you heard of these. that were just a point with a lot of whistle holes in them. Wait, like... Just like a like a metal whistle, like I, or even bone. I don't think I don't remember what it was, but just imagine like a bunch of whistles at the at the point sure. of the arrow. Sure. Okay. Okay. So then, when you actually throw that arrow to the air, it whistles like it's forty more arrows, not just the one. Oh. So so sneaky. when yeah, you throw a volley of that over a, a castle wall, and you hear all these, you know, these. Yeah. So it just make puts people in a panic mode. You know? <laughs> I mean, that's a great way to do it. And then talking about rumor mongering, there's a ton of stories that I've read in different books and people go back and forth. It happened. No, it didn't happen. No, it sure. happened. It was grossly exaggerated. One story that I heard that I think was grossly exaggerated from other sources that I've read, and I've actually been unable to find it elsewhere a little bit after that, mm -hmm. was that they partied, I believe it was in the siege of Kiev, but it might have been somewhere else where they actually put a platform and partied on top of the population. Oh, my God, really? And just squash, twist them to death. What? And the reason I believe it's Kiev because, is because I've also, hold on, though, yes. So I've also heard a lot of that was, that was not, that was not what happened. That's really exaggerated. And there's a story in Kiev where there was a bunch of people on the balcony and the balcony fell during the siege. They were just sure. trying to find refuge and, and the balcony fell and squashed the population Some underneath. Okay. So so there's that story going on. But there were all these horrible stories of what the Mongols did. Sure. That would just precede them God. with fear. And that's hard to imagine, like literal like dancing over a platform. Yeah, that's pretty rough. That's and so when you when you remember also that the Mongols are also known for being the one religious tolerant religiously tolerant community of their time yeah i did hear about that too we know that now but when, we, when i was a kid that's not what you would hear from the mongols mongolians know that so to mongolians genghis is a hero right to the europeans genghis is a monster and now we're beginning to bridge that those two notions and, right and know right, that right so they the, the mongolian horde was the one community of its time where you were free to practice whatever religious vocation you had really Yes. So Genghis, in fact, was a spiritualist. He was an animist. Okay. I think his, his form of ch shamanism was called Tengrism. I'm not sure right now. Okay. His wife, his first wife, I believe, is a Christian. He had a ton of wives. So mm. and he had Buddhists, uh, Muslims in the horde. They had Nestorian Christians. These are Christians before the Roman, what right. we know as Roman Catholics. They right, followed right, right. a prophet called Nestor. So an historian, Christians, a bunch of stuff. Um, well, I mean, it makes sense if you're taking over all of these different places, like in order to help keep people happy, don't force a lot of things on them. Let right. them continue their lives. Just know that 
you just have a different person to answer to now. Well, yeah, but the, the Romans, for example, would adapt um, paganism to their religion. Um, but that we, is true, but that's that's a story for a different. But day. I think I think what I'm talking about though is between among the Mongols themselves. So it's not even when they start expanding; it's among right. the different tribes of Mongols. You're allowed to believe whatever tickles your fancy. They don't oh, care. Okay. But then they're the guys that that destroy the in, inexpugnable fortress of the Alamut. Have you heard of that? I I think so. So I think they touched on something similar to this in the show. But I want yeah, go ahead and tell me about this because I, I think I think so, but I I want to know more. Okay. So there's this Muslim sect, Shiite sect called the sect of the assassins, and we'll get into that in a second. The assassins. Yeah, they're feared the world over and they concentrate on different fort fortified cities they're right. like a federation of fortified cities and they come from this Shiite section living in Sunni Muslim country okay. countries um, and I, I don't know if Sunni I don't know if I'm pronouncing it properly but there's like two main factions of Islam one is the Sunni, Sunni and the other one's Shiite Okay. I, I don't know if I'm I know how to pronounce it in Spanish not in English sorry um, I will find <laughs> I will find out but um, and they are they've been there for like a few centuries already. They they are this kind of warrior monks sort of sect. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That that do pretty much like hits for almost like for you know. So like hired mercenary type deal. Kind of thing. Yeah. And uh, and they're known as uh, as the initiators of the origin of the word assassin, because the myth as the myth tells, they were said to be on a hashish high. Oh, so is it hashish, hashish or or hashish in English? Hashish, hashish. Okay. Yeah. So they were so hashishin, as you were going to point out. Yeah, that is the origin of assassin. So, they so say, hashishin, and then it just kind of devolves to now we know right. assassin. Correct. Uh, and I don't know if I'm pronouncing it right because in Spanish it's with an e, so it's I say. So it's the reason that they would be on a hash, a hash high essentially, mm -hmm. because it just like took a lot of their cares away or like Probably, what was the yeah. purpose I, for that I, I don't know i think yeah they, they would just give them valor or something because they, they these were suicide missions oh yeah i mean i, I, I mean, see that they were they were almost 100 percent accurate in hits they were very feared but they put themselves in a situation that they couldn't get out of that's why they could actually take the hit to the you know just be successful right because they the, at that point it's you either complete the mission or you don't Right, so they would complete the mission, but then they were like, you know, there's no exit strategy. Right, right? like now they're <laughs> they're fucked, you know. So that's so they uh, the the biggest the capital of that sect was the fortress of the Alamut, okay. which was in on on top of a cliff in an inexpugnable. It was one of these like strategic dreams of an unconquerable position. So like up on the whole mountain with yeah. sheer it, cliffs. Exactly. And... If you try to go up there, like the archers pick you up. Like, you know, it's it's just not okay. impossible to seize. Like it has access to water from a different place. That There's a, a creek that just flows in there. I don't, it was just okay. impossible. To, and uh, by the time the Mongols started making their dent in the world, when the Mongols went there and they were on their way somewhere else, somehow <laughs> the... Uh, Alamut surrendered to the Mongols. Wait, what? Yeah, they just, you know, <laughs> this place that had been inexpugnable, that had been the thing of myth and nightmare to the Western world. Right. This feared, feared place of warrior monks that, were, that weren't that were afraid to die. When the Mongols came, they were like, all right, okay, we're, we will surrender. So they surrendered, and the Mongols just, in case, just to make sure, just leveled the place down. <laughs> <laughs> just to make sure that nobody came behind them and fortified themselves up there. Okay, so I have I have heard of this, but okay, it, this was covered in the show, but not oh, in cool. one of the two seasons. This was actually a special that was centered around one of the characters from the show that has become like a fan favorite. Okay, this character's name is One Hundred Eyes. I love the name, and he is one of these assassins. Okay, He's been a trained oh, cool. assassin. Yeah, but they did an entire special for his backstory because it was just so interesting. Then they wanted to cover it off on this. So in the special, it opens up with them getting a report like, "Hey, the Mongols are on their way. They're almost here. What are we going to do?" And they say, "Well, we're just going to evacuate. Mm -hmm. We're just going to open the door and we're going to evacuate and get everyone out." And then there is the leader of them who decides, I'm going to stay behind in order to give you enough time to get enough distance so they don't wind up going after you mm -hmm. just to try and kill all you off. I'm going to stay behind and try and just 
death mission, destroy as many as I can while mm-hmm. I can. And so in this special, in, in this um, depiction, you see the Mongols just come charging through the gates and like they're not, there's just reckless abandon. They're like, mm-hmm. statue, smash it. Just start yeah. breaking everything. I gotta watch this show. This and tearing like it down. Fun, yeah. And then it gets to this part where this guy, this character, 100 Eyes, is just standing there and he's got his tools and he's just patiently waiting. And the Mongols look at him and they're like, so, some guy? So he does like what, martial arts or something? Yeah, like, so it's like a mixture of martial arts okay. and um, like using weaponry to like to his advantage. So like, I think a lot of it was focused on like these chains that had like little claws at the end. Okay. Um, and staffs and trying to like use things at a distance and like give yourself space and room to maneuver in order to work it to your advantage. Okay. So that was like the basis of like their their strategies. Right, okay. But he's just standing there waiting and it's just one guy. And so they kind of pause for a minute and they're like, <laughs> one guy. Ah, and they start going after him and then he just starts taking him out. 20, 30, like these guys are dropping like flies. Oh, fine, and yeah. eventually one of the commanders just kind of rides up and he's sitting there watching on his horse. And eventually they manage to like get a couple good kicks in and they get him down to his arms and legs and they're holding him. And before they kill him, the general's like, wait a minute, just uh, bring him with us. The Khan will want this one. Yeah. Because they've just watched these incredible fighting tactics that they've never seen before. And they're like, this is information that we could use in the Empire. Right. Bring him along. And so, you know, he brings him over to Kublai, and then Kublai's like, well, just to make sure you don't actually try and hurt any of us, I'm just going to have to take your eyes. And so he actually winds up blinding the man, and then has him teach his techniques okay. to some of his yeah, that's men. That's why he's, what is it, 1,000 eyes or 100? 100 eyes. Okay. The mythos is that he gets over his, like, blindness by using, like, hypersensitive other senses, essentially. Right, okay. And can still essentially, like, see without seeing. Cool. But it's just a very cool character, and yeah. then that 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 is like. I will say that, that that is pretty fictionalized, but that sounds like fun. But well, yeah, I mean, they turned it into a real good story. But I'll say that. as we were talking earlier, so that's that's right. kind of where you kind of tint the you know the history a little bit. But right, yeah, tint it to make it a better, more compelling story. It's still based in fact, mm-hmm. but we're just gonna tweak it a little yeah. bit this way just to make it a little better, yeah. like, richer story. I can't, I know I've stressed this already. But I'm going to say it again, because it always bears repeating. Always question everything that you are told or taught. Because appearances are just even. Right. And so are narratives. Well, so. Well, you know, we've learned about Genghis being a monster, and then it turns out he's very tolerant. Right, Uh, right, right. You know, I mean, there were things like um, he kind of, he divided his empire so his kids wouldn't fight amongst themselves because they were kind of fighters. Okay. But but he gave the great, the, the bigger con... Instead of to his elder son, who everybody was expecting. And to, when you say great con, you mean like the one above all the rest. Yeah, there's kind there's of other cons. Yeah, the, but then there is like the con of cons. Everybody, is it something like that. Yes, yeah. exactly. So he gave that to one of his second kids, um, Ogode, who was Ogode. called, who had a sense of humor. So apparently he's had... He's, well, like a jokester? Like a prankster? Well, like, a, I mean, like a Loki sort of thing? Yeah, he, he was kind of funny. He, he, he would do things like they would tell him that um, some of the vendors were cheating him okay with the prices and he said i know he would tell us his channels, <laughs> i know but just let them think that we don't because in that way you know we control what they're cheating us on and they feel better about themselves so instead of you know and this is the same guy instead of calling about and punishing him yeah this is the same guy that cut the hands of one guy who came to him to tell him that he'd had a dream that the great genghis had appeared to him in his sleep this is after genghis is dead of course sure uh and had asked him to turn the horde to buddhism and he asked him, pray tell, what language did the great Khan address you in? He said, well, Mandarin, of course. Well, since um, Genghis did not speak Mandarin, he just spoke Mongolian, you are lying, cut off his hands. <laughs> and he had his hands cut off or something, or he had them paled or something like or that. Or his tongue pulled out or something. Or yeah, something. yeah, yeah. So right. the, I don't remember exactly what it was, but he had it mutilated. It's still brutal. But yeah. But I can see how it's like, oh, well, but he was interesting you should say that because he never spoke Mandarin. <laughs> That's right. And Genghis himself, like I read, um, I don't remember exactly, so I know what book I read it in, and I can actually, it's in Spain, so when I go back there, I'll, I'll look it up. But there's a, there's a written account of somebody in the West who describes Genghis in person. Mm-hmm. And I think it's either, a, it's a youth, it's a, he's either a student or he's, 
I don't know if he's a teenager or just a youth in his 30s. I, I, I don't know, sure. 20s. Um, and this is, I think, during Byzantium, when they, t- they took over Constantinople or Byzantium or one of these big cities. In, so it's a massive city, though. Yeah, it's, it's okay. a massive Christian city. And the Mongols just take it over, and they send a message to the population. The population actually surrenders and open the gates, so they are spared. Sure. And the Mongols so, so make... they took him up on his offer of, like, correct. just open the gates and we'll be good. As, as you know, and that they would usually issue a challenge of, like, surrender or else. Right. You know, and so it was surrender, so they, they walked in there peacefully, and they were all invited to attend, a, a, um, to go see the Khan in the cathedral. So I think it was just a demonstration of power of the Mongols. Okay. Where it, and in fact, what happened was, you know, Genghis rode up to the altar of the main cathedral or something. <laughs> and, you know, just with his, with his horse. Just or to like show. all the way through town? I don't know. No, I, I think he just, no, the, the, he just made everybody at, congregate around the cathedral and then the Khan just went up on horseback okay. right up to the altar, which is kind of blasphemous. Just like to show, all the way up the stairs and everything? Yeah, yeah, to the altar with the horse, <laughs> uh, which is kind of showing, like, who's boss. You know, it's it's a kind of an right. insult. Right, that's, that's totally a power move. It's a, demo, that's a, power. It's a total power move. So this guy, I read this account, and I think he was Italian. I don't know, maybe in Greek. I didn't read it in Greek. I read it in it's translated, translated in Spanish. Translated in Spanish, yeah. Yeah, and he's talking about how he's, like, everybody's really curious. They want to see the mighty Genghis, you know. Right. And they see all these. Uh, so they line them all up in the streets and make them make a corridor, like a parade corridor. Yep. And these all these mighty, terrible, really scary looking Mongolian generals on horseback in full armor. Right. You know, these really scary looking dudes. And, and he's trying to pick out which one of them Genghis is. And he writes, and at some point they all open up. And this little old guy with whiskers, with with a little sheepskin <laughs> thing, you know, on a, on a horse that looks like, like a goat. Mr. Miyagi looking yeah, character. Kind of like that. <laughs> you know, on a goat looking like small little horse. And this, I don't know if it's, and he just like rides up, you know, to the, to the altar and then looks at everybody and kind of like nods and goes, all right, guys, that's enough of that shit, you know. And then just rides all the way down. <laughs> so that's kind of him. Something great and terrible fearful yeah Genghis Khan he was like this old little who this might have been a piece of work when he was young I mean that guy I guess that's you know, true as he got older but yeah. like but that uh, he's old now I mean he can he can ride a horse at the time of having like this yeah. reputation right 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 this is an old man that can still ride a horse so that's a pretty tough sturdy old man you that know? is also true uh, and he just like you know he does his thing like all right you know and he just doesn't have <laughs> much to prove at that point so you know Appearances do deceive, and personalities are indeed complex, and not everything is, you know, as it seems, as straight or as you know, clear cut as we would all like it to be. Well, as we all know, when it comes to history, history is written by the winners. It does not often that you get accurate portrayals of the people who lost in battles or even remember them sometimes. Right, which is why dissent is so healthy. And questioning your narratives and not taking them for granted at face value and always, you know. Right. It's important to always try and find the, the truth in things, for sure. Indeed. You should triangulate the signal. Do what now? Triangulate the signal. What does that what does that even mean? So you take a story from one source. Okay. And then you find an opposite source. And kind of read the story from that opposite source. Right. I, I'm used to that. Like, and then you find a third one, and right in the middle of the triangle, somewhere in the middle of the triangle. Oh, I get it. Is the truth. Correct. Okay. I get that. Triangulate. I, I, I guess I never really thought of it as like the triangulate. I've heard it as like, you know, just check your facts against sources and mm-hmm. all of that. But I, the triangulation thing makes more sense because it's like these are three different perspectives, essentially. It's borrowed. Yeah. It's borrowed from, um, from satellite. Um, signal pinpointing right that's what they do they get three satellites and then that's right. how you get your gps mm. triangulate the signal triangulate the signal all right everyone thank you so much for listening and until next time stay out of prison and walk in the shade mm-hmm.